up to you all to let me know when. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for uh, coming out today. I truly do appreciate it. Uh, and I'm honored to be joined by uh, my Republican colleague uh, from DuPage County, Senator Mike Connolly, and uh, Adam Schuster, who is uh, going to be with us here today as we talk and we answer some questions about a constitutional amendment that myself uh, and Senator Connolly and many others within the General Assembly, at least in uh, the Senate, on both sides of the aisle, have signed on to to uh, start bringing a ca spending cap amendment uh, forward as a constitutional opportunity for our citizens to actually talk about and uh, vote on hopefully this coming November. Uh, we feel that a spending cap where Illinois is today, uh, allowing for growth within our state budget, allowing for growth uh, that comes natural and understanding the opportunities and the realization that it does cost money every year to run the government. But there is a growth level that we should maintain. Instead of increasing our growth every year by double-digit increases, we should definitely keep our spending cap at close to 3%. So we're proposing a 2.89% uh, spending cap that will go forward and be available for all of our budgets going forward. We want this as a constitutional amendment, so it puts it in. We also have a background sort of safety clause if emergencies do come forward. We certainly don't if we have a flood, if we have tornadoes, if we have emergencies throughout the state of Illinois. We don't want to say we can't be responsive to those. So those are, are within this limit as well. And there is an opportunity for the General Assembly to do emergency spending if we have an emergency in Illinois. Uh, so I'm very honored today to be here for this. We will answer questions if you need be. And I'll offer uh, my Senate colleague, Mike Connolly, the opportunity to speak. Good morning. I'm a State Senator Mike Connolly from the 21st District, which is Western DuPage County, and I want to thank Tom Cullerton for his leadership on this. Uh, I think Tom and I, well, I know Tom and I both come from a municipal background, and when you have a municipal background, uh, you're familiar with uh, budget hearings, <coughs> uh, long budget hearings, by the way, typically uh, over many days. Sometimes when I was on the county board, it, we went for, I think, four months of hearings around the county. And we live within our means. And I think what we're doing here is addressing the concern you hear from Republicans and Democratic uh, residents alike, which is, you know, what are you going to do about spending uh, growing, um, frankly, out of control? And I think this puts in place a measure uh, of fiscal discipline for future General Assemblies. Um, there is growth uh, included there. Uh, we hope for a robust economic uh, uh, boom in the state of Illinois over the next 10, 15 years. That's, that's our hope, so that revenues do grow uh, at a much higher level. But I think this puts in place a number for our budgeteers to uh, continue to look two, three uh, years down the road uh, at putting together and formulating a budget that does live within its means. And uh, I think this is a very strong statement of bipartisanship. Uh, Maybe it's just a DuPage County thing, Tom. But uh, we, uh, we look forward to uh, working with our respective caucuses to get it to the floor and get it to the voters in November. Thank you. Sure. So I just want to say I applaud uh, Senators Cullerton and Senator Connolly for standing up and doing the right thing and having the courage to push for real solutions for taxpayers. Passing the budget is arguably the most important job that the state does every year. And as everybody here knows, we haven't uh, done a great job of that historically. But we're here to talk about forward-looking solutions, not about the past. And what this amendment would do is give taxpayers certainty that they deserve. So our research showed that over recent years, state spending grew 25% faster than residents' personal income, which is obviously unsustainable. And even when we have past revenue estimates, uh, they haven't always been accurate. So what this would do, spending cap amendment would do, is give lawmakers a magic number around which to plan the budget every year and ensure that future spending growth does not outpace what taxpayers can afford. Um, so the process is broken and taxpayers deserve better and that's why we're here uh, happy to stand next to the senators who are doing the right thing and pushing this amendment. Any questions? So could, you yes. like, could you explain how this is indexed <clears throat> so you don't have to re-amend the Constitution every time you want to change it? So what, what this will do is it will go forward, uh, and the growth will be every year. So this will be every year based on prior years at a 
2.89% growth every year. So it'll be capped out. That'll be the maximum growth that we can go every year. So in years that we have great growth in the state of Illinois, uh, we can utilize those, those dollars that go beyond the 2.89. Our goal here with this is to eventually get Illinois to a point where we're holding reserves, to eventually get Illinois to a point where we're able to consistently pay down our backlog of bills instead of having to bond out for our bills. Uh, so if we can keep our spending tied to that as opposed to, you know, if you look at Illinois' growth over any 10-year period, we've always traditionally grown at a 3%. So it's not always true when people say we aren't growing in Illinois. Traditionally, we always have grown in Illinois, uh, and this will sort of keep us at that easy and even level. So 2.89 is memorialized in the Constitution under your plan? So that would be where we would put it at, yes. Can I just add Go right to, to the Senator's point? So um, t he's absolutely right. 2.89% is um, over a 10-year period. That was a recent rate of growth. Uh, but the, the way the constitutional amendment's drafted, it looks at federal data, and it looks at the most recent 10-year period of growth, and it pegs the growth in the next year's state spending to the prior 10 years. So it wouldn't need to be amended um, each year, as I said. President of Missouri, uh, with their graduated income tax, you know, 7000 is a top earner. So you don't want to be in a, I know it's not apples to apples, but you don't want to be in a situation where what you've written is... Uh, Sadly, many times when we compare to other states, very rarely is it apples to apples. What's the deadline to, to pass this? I thought somebody said they thought the deadline had passed the constitutional amendments this year. Not yet. When is it? I right want now? to say it's... Can you get close to the mic? Oh, sorry. Uh, I want to say it's two weeks, but I would have to check with staff. May 6th. May 6th. May 6th. So uh, two weeks, for about a week and a half from today. Senator, the, the deadline is May 6th, but the House is in recession next week and they have to pass it. So the effective deadline is tomorrow. Um, given that, will you guys reintroduce this next session for consideration? So. I would just add that, um, you know, while the constitutional amendment enshrining this in the Constitution is the ultimate goal, uh, lawmakers could always choose to adopt a spending cap amendment voluntarily and to cap the growth in spending at a prior year's uh, tenure average of growth. So um, even passing the General Assembly, as you all probably know, would not be enough to change the Constitution. It will ultimately have to go to voters. And whether that happens in 2018 or 2020, you could always choose to uh, implement this as a budgeting strategy immediately. But will you reintroduce it? Yes. Well, I'll continue to introduce this. I will continue to try. If it, if we, I don't ever like to say my bills fail, but if by chance they do, I will reintroduce it as well. Is there a companion bill in the house? There is a companion bill in the house. It is um, HJRCA thirty eight, um, and it's Representative Alan Skillicorn, Skillicorn who is uh, who is running that. I don't, uh, I don't know. We have an incredible amount of co-sponsors, Democrat and Republican. Uh, I don't know how much work has gone on. I haven't really paid attention to what the House sponsor or the House is doing over on their uh, version. Senator Fullerton, we don't often see uh, Senate Democrats wanting to cap anything. Is this a true measure of bipartisanship? Well, I mean, so again, as Senator Connolly and, and I both talked about, uh, we're both out of DuPage. We both... Uh, we both have come from local government. Uh, I was a village president in the greatest recession of all of our lives. Uh, we had over 250, close to 300 foreclosures in our town, and we're losing money pretty significantly. I also voted against the tax <coughs> increase. Uh, our goal right here is to show that we are going to work together to figure out what is going on in this state and how we can actually maintain and eventually get to a level where we do have reserves. I think you'll see in a bipartisan effort, if you look at sort of the budgeteer group, uh, that is a bipartisan effort where both sides go back and forth, bring up budget proposals, and come forward together. Uh, they don't always agree. They don't always end up. But I will say uh, the groups of both of those people coming together and talking is something that is not always seen by the general public because uh, most people consider we come down here and fight all the time. Uh, Senator Connolly and I not only do legislation here, but in district, we're together quite frequently because we travel in the same circle with the mayor's caucuses and other caucuses throughout, and we have a lot of joint interests in DuPage County as well. Is something President Fullerton would get behind? I'm rubbing off on him. He doesn't want to admit it. <laughs> uh, you know what? We have not approached the Senate president yet, uh, so I imagine once that, uh, that'll be something that'll be a very long conversation, 
uh, and I don't know if we've even talked with the minority leader yet. Our main goal is to get, uh, I want to say, the, the meat and bones of this really pushed forward, get some good positive feedback on it, have people get behind it, uh, also sort of look at our colleagues who are not in leadership to really start pushing this as well. Uh, if you see that, that seems to be ways things get done really well around here is when myself, Senator Connolly, and it's not just the leader-driven stuff, it's all the other bills that get moved uh, by us in the General Assembly. We just heard a, um, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, as someone who's bills to, <laughs> many times when I was in the House, they never got out of the Rules Committee, and here they get to committee, but they typically don't get a hearing. What makes this uh, so intriguing is the bipartisanship uh, with Tom leading the way. I'm hopeful. Um, that it gets a hearing and we will continue to file it. A question was asked earlier uh, because this is Springfield and a lot of times it takes one or two general assemblies to get the momentum, to get it to the floor and ultimately uh, to the voters. We just heard a revenue estimate number from the House GOP, 37.6 billion dollars. If this amendment was in place right now, uh, what would that mean for <coughs> next year? How much, how much more could we spend? So um, if you look at the most recent 10-year period, the economy grew at 2.4%. So if you add that on to the 2018 budget, that would be uh, $36.9 billion for this year's spending. So what happens if um, you know, the economy is stagnant and we actually see less of a revenue estimate? Say you know, next year comes in at $35 billion because of the economic downturn or whatever it may be. So the, ni the nice thing about the way the amendment's drafted is it looks at a 10-year period, so I'm sure you probably know recessions generally don't last 10 years. Um, so an average of growth over a 10-year period will probably be a stable uh, indicator of, of the long-term trajectory of the economy. So that's, you know, that long-term stable average of growth is about what the growth in spending should be. Uh, the, the policy has too has been running advertisements against the graduate income tax that clearly have their own lobbying for things like this also, but Senator Cullerton in particular, the Policy Institute behind this plan, wasn't that kind of uh, hurt uh, likely backing by the Democrats who run the legislature? So that's a different subject. That's a, a political side. I know. Well, uh, when, I, when, I, when I run bills down here, I run bills that I feel are good for Illinois are good for the economy, are, are good for, I do a lot of work with my local mayors and a lo, uh, my local uh, elected officials, school boards, etc. Uh, and I feel these are positive ways that I move things forward here. Uh, on the political side, I can't really speak how that'll all play out. Uh, but for me, the continuation of doing good policy is more important than worrying about what the political fallout from all of this will be. And I would, I would just add from the Illinois Policy Institute's perspective, we're a nonpartisan organization. We don't get involved in advocating for or against candidates. Uh, we're willing to work from any, with anybody on either side of the aisle if they're pushing for taxpayer solutions. And what if um, the governor gets his way and we get you know, uh, an income tax that's only 3% instead of 4.95? Um, what happens with this amendment and the spending cap? If, if the tax rates were to decrease and we don't bring in as much revenue as we're having now, what would happen with this spending? I believe, it still be, I believe it'd still be indexable over 10 years, okay. and it, would be, it wouldn't be 2.89. The number would come down. That's my understanding. Well, it, it, if at any point uh, revenue were to come in higher than the spending cap, first of all, that would be a great situation to be in. Um, and there's a few things you could do. As Senator Colerton mentioned, you could put that into the budget stabilization funds for saving for the future in emergency situations. You could use it to pay down the backlog of bills. Or ultimately, what we'd like to see it, from the Illinois Policy Institute's perspective <coughs> is to see some of that money used for tax relief so that the, the rates can come down. I want to give a quick anecdote. A couple years ago, I was at NCSL in Chicago, and there was a state senator I met from Tennessee, and he was kind of, I don't want to, i got to be careful how I say this, but he was, you know, he's from the middle of Tennessee, and he's never been to Chicago before. And he says, you've got so many great assets here. And he goes, but I see you guys have a budget problem. And I said, well, we do. I said, well, how is it in Tennessee? Well, we have a problem. We, we've got a surplus this year, and I'm thinking maybe it's $30 million, $20 million, whatever. It was over a billion dollars of surplus. And Texas has a surplus. And Texas and Tennessee have these types of caps. 
And uh, in as much as, I mean, every year we have uh, people who bring bills for new spending programs, which are all well-intentioned. Uh, what this will do for future General Assemblies is put in place uh, structural fiscal discipline uh, to hopefully get to that point where we do have a surplus to get rid of our unpaid bill list and uh, be able to have that rainy day fund going forward like Texas, Tennessee, and Maine and Washington. S&D put out a report uh, last week comparing California and Illinois, uh, and talking with one of their analysts, they said, hey, California, they did a temporary tax increase as well after the recession, uh, but they led with budget cuts first, and they were able to build a, you know, reserves. Um, Illinois didn't. How is this going to help fix Illinois' spending problems? I think a lot of what these types of bills and these types of conversations need to continue. Um, and it needs to continue on a bipartisan basis, and it needs to be brought forward. Uh, I think uh, many people look at the fact that, again, I'll go back to a lot of it's a perception image. People think we just don't get along down here, that we fight down here, that we aren't going to be able to deal with each other and work with each other. Uh, the more that bills such as these come in that say we want to and we're addressing and looking forward and putting into the public eye that we're willing to look at uh, sort of the waste, and, the waste and abuse of the taxpayer dollars. I'll give a perfect example. Yesterday passed with or going to the floor on third reading today, uh, the Government Severance Pay Act, which shows payouts that are made to administrators that are wasting taxpayer dollars. These are things that incrementally we need to get the public on our side as we're looking forward to moving towards things like this and fiscal responsibility. And I'll bring it back again to my time in small government. You know, you have a budget and you have to stick within that because the state of Illinois can penalize you. And the state of Illinois can penalize you when you don't have those numbers correct. Uh, so this is something that we feel continuing to move forward is a better opportunity. How do you explain this to voters if it does pass and gets on the ballot? Uh, uh, you think this is something voters are going to easily glom onto? I, I would suggest that the voters uh, year after year ask us to do just this. Let's 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 cap spending. Let's put in place something that will rein in, uh, you know, out of control Springfield is what they'll say. But this uh, is something that I think would be an easy sell back home, certainly in our county. I actually just want to add something to the question about California. Senator Cullerton's answer was great. Um, but California actually has a spending cap. Uh, so there was a question earlier about bipartisanship, and uh, this is not an ideological or a partisan issue. About half of U.S. states have some sort of spending cap. Some are better than others because some of them are in the Constitution, some of them are statutory. Um, but we see this from states ranging from California to Texas to Florida. So you can see that this is not a, a partisan measure, an ideological measure. It's a good government, common sense uh, way to restrain the growth in spending. And what kinds of emergencies would allow for the cap to be? I mean, if, I mean, you saw the flood in Houston, Texas. Uh, I mean, Washington, Illinois was struck by a, a tornado years ago. Um, we were talking about that earlier yeah, today. I mean, County last year. Sure, the flooding. We had flooding in DuPage a couple of years ago, which required uh, FEMA assistance. But, uh, I mean, Texas has this, and they have tornadoes and all sorts of natural disasters. Houston had the flooding. So um, those are the like types of things. Home, which now has like 200 plus million dollar price tag and something like that. Do you consider that an emergency? I'm thinking natural disasters, but I think that we're working on that uh, legislatively uh, right now. I would, I would imagine that uh, that is something we would look at as a legislative uh, opportunity and also uh, part of the, the, the thing with the veterans homeowner is 65% of that will hopefully be funded by the federal government as well. Uh, when you talk a lot of the emergencies that we have, yes, we apply for federal funds, for flooding, for tornadoes, for natural disasters, uh, but at the same time, we can't leave that hanging out there right now. Um, the, the Veterans Home, in my mind, would probably qualify, but again, that would go through something that would have to be part of a legislative process, because due to the way this is crafted, if there is an emergency, we would have an emergency vote to take those measures up. Thank you all very much.